One of the most fascinating figures in the Old Testament to me is the warrior Joab. He was David's right-hand man. He led numerous military campaigns, a man of tremendous courage and military skill, no doubt blessed and used of God in all sorts of ways to advance the righteous reign of King David. But there's a catch because Joab didn't really know when to let the ax handle drop. In fact, at one point in 2 Samuel 19, uh, David says this about Joab and his associates. What have I to do with you, you sons of Zeruiah, that you should this day be as an adversary to me? Shall anyone be put to death in Israel this day? What you're hearing there in 2 Samuel 19, uh, verse 22, is a king who himself has been called to lead in military campaigns, but is weary of bloodshed. How does that relate to today? How does that relate to 2024? Well, welcome to Grace and Truth. My name is Owen Strand. I will be your host. Today on the podcast, I am joined again, a now two-time guest by Dale Thakra. He's a pastor at Redeemer Bible Church in Gilbert, Arizona. He's a great friend of mine. He's, he's just a terrific man, and he's a very wise brother and wisdom. Just a quick word here. Wisdom is undervalued in a very serious way, but uh, we're reminded of the old King James uh, rendering of wisdom with all you're getting, get wisdom. So Dale, thank you for sharing your wisdom on the podcast today. I'm very thankful to be here, Owen. And you're you're a special person to me, a good friend to me and to our church. And we love you very much. Well, I feel the same way. I really do. And uh, I am so thankful to talk with you for a second episode about men. Uh, mm-hmm. As we were uh, discussing there just a minute ago, um, I'll frame it this way. Anger and a spirit of fighting is is not um, alien to the pages of scripture. There's all sorts of men in, in scripture who, who struggle with anger and who, um, exert their anger on others. And, uh, there's all kinds of bad consequences toward that end. Dale, I think today, I want to hear from you. I think today that we are kind of in the age of the angry man. That's not the only way men struggle. Um, I've written a book right here. It's called War on Men. I talk about disappearing men. I talk about effeminate men. So I think there's lots of ways, sadly, Satan targets men and gets them in bad places uh, of sin. But one of the one of the most prevalent, I think, is the angry man. Do you see this phenomenon outside the church and inside the church today? And if so, to what extent? Yeah, I mean, I do because I when I visit X.com or formerly known as Twitter, it's all over the place. Um, there's a lot of angry, angry men out there. And uh, it's not it's not hard to find. That's for sure. You can see it in their words. You can see it in actions. Uh, you can see it in actions that don't take place that should take place. Yeah, there, there's anger everywhere. I think there's a number of contributing factors here. I think we'll probably talk about several of them. Um, we can talk about the the theology angle. Um, I think that a fair number of folks out there, sadly, have a fear-based paradigm of the Christian life. And at the top of that, is it really kind of an angry God who has mm-hmm. about this much grace to offer? And, uh, you know, you use up your daily allotment in like six minutes in the morning and then you're done. And then God is just kind of angry at you. That affects not just men, but women. Um, but mm-hmm. I think there's also a very strong there's a very strong uh, sociological angle with the breakdown of the home, with fatherlessness in the church. There's the angle of um, pastors who at least a good number of folks feel over the last decade with one issue after another hitting the church. And you really do feel for pastors in, in some respect. But there are a good number of folks out there who weren't shepherded through lockdowns, through wokeness, through attacks on, on men, uh, lots of things. L- let's talk about that last angle. Do you see young men coming into your church who who are kind of in a in a fevered condition um they're they're angry they're they're unfathered both in the home and in the church do you do you see that as a reality today yeah i I think it's not only a reality in our church but probably every church that yes uh, that's out there um and and really i think you know we, we were talking earlier on the, on the other episode about discipleship and and we're we're being discipled by somebody and something always. Right? Mm. And I think the culture, um, I don't think it's, I don't think it's a stretch to say that the culture will disciple 
um, all of us towards towards anger. Why? Because we're in a culture where contentment is not is not ever achieved. It's only you only have to continue to strive to be content, get the things you want. It's, it becomes about you. Um, so you mm-hmm. become the center of of every pursuit that you that you undertake. Right? It's for your satisfaction. Uh, your uh, pleasure is probably the better word. Um, and when, when that doesn't happen, you, you get angry you, and then you start, you get angry at yourself because you're, you're not good enough to, to capture what it is you're going after, mm-hmm. um, where you get angry at others because you blame others for not getting what it is that, that you think is going to, you're going to find pleasure in. And really, I think the underlying root of, of most anger in men and women, um, but what's, we're here to talk about men is that they don't, they don't. They don't get what they want, when they want it, how they want it, mm. and it fuels their anger. And, and yes, it's it's outside the church and inside the church. Okay, that's really important. I think we can say I'm just drafting off of what you're you're throwing here. Uh, I'm catching what you're pitching, bro. Um, and and uh, I think we could say that there's probably some understandable desires that have not been met for some men, and then this easily gets into territory where your whole life is a life of bitterness. Uh, And that can be true for men. We're talking about men because they're struggling so much on this episode. It can also absolutely be true for women. Women can live a life of bitterness, Mm -hmm. anger, anxiety, and so on. So this isn't a one-sided conversation, but, but back to men, it's a lot of men out there didn't have a father or didn't have a good relationship with their father or didn't have a Christian father. There's different forms of that. Mm-hmm. Um, well, that's an understandable desire that is going to, that's going to leave you with some baggage, isn't it? Um, and, and men need to be honest about that. There's also stuff where you just want your life the way exactly it should be. You don't want any interruptions. You and I talked earlier about how tired <laughs> lots of providers are. I know this personally. You come home. Uh, you just want to be able to rest and relax, uh, and you need some things on your terms for a change. At least you think you do. And the day goes haywire. And before you know it, there's chaos in the home that you weren't planning on, but it's there. So there's, there's understandable desires that aren't met. And then there's problematic desires that are expectations that shouldn't be there. Um, how do you help rebuild men coming into, uh, the church, uh, with that wreckage? Yeah, you know, it's. I, I mentioned this in the last podcast as well. There, there's an autobiographical reality to how I handle this um, with guys that I work with. I, you know, you use the word expectation, and I think I think that really where it's it's, it's where it should start. It's what are, what are your expectations about not only who you are, but who other people are, and then not only what you're pursuing and what you currently have. Um, but what is it that God wants you to pursue and what does he want you to have? And I think that battle internal in your own heart, in your own soul, is really the beginning of, of trying to get to the bottom of anger issues. Um, now, mm. there's a lot of psychology out there about anger, right? You can mm. you can take anger courses, and uh, but I, I don't think a lot of them really deal with the, the core issue that um, it's how we see God and how we see ourselves, which is mm. really the main issue. Um, that's at least what comes out inside the, the biblical counseling room uh, that I have been a part of for 20 plus years now um, yeah. when dealing with anger. It, it's, it's, it's false expectations or wrong expectations of, of, um, the, that you either put on yourself or others have put on you. Um, it's, yeah. it's, it's, it's both end. Um, and understanding what God wants from you and expects from you and uh, really kind of getting guys to think clearly about that. I, and I think there's, there's freedom when you understand who you are in Christ. There's freedom when you understand the, the things that you should be pursuing versus the expectations that maybe you have placed on yourself or others mm-hmm. have placed on you. I've seen wives do this to husbands. I've seen husbands do this to wives yep. where they place these expectations that are just not reasonable based on mm-hmm. gifting, talent, whatever. Um, they're just not reasonable. And they're not godly sometimes. And so um, that, that can fuel um, a discontentment or an anger that, um, that can get out of control pretty quickly. 
And that necessitates, as you alluded to a minute ago, a real gospel focus where, um, you know, the wife is looking at her husband from the standpoint of the gospel. He's a recipient of God's grace. He's not perfect. He's not Jesus. And the husband is also uh, very much appropriating the gospel and realizing that um, that he needs to be humbled in that reality, in that realization. He needs mm -hmm. to he needs to understand that he's got work to do by the power of God's grace. So the wife, in my experience, working with folks, knowing my own heart, my, my own marriage, a, a wife can be can be. Um, Judging a husband as losing a game he doesn't know he's playing, uh, and a husband can be failing to play a game that he should be playing, um, just, to, just to use a sort of curious metaphor. And, yeah. and that's a, just a different way of saying exactly what you are saying wisely here, that there can be expectations on one side, and there can be not grasped expectations on the other. And so part of what has to happen in a marriage is is healthy communication. But that's often, first of all, Satan makes it hard to communicate. Secondly, have you seen modern schedules today? Uh, there's not a lot of time to talk. And, and, and thirdly, even when we do sit down to, to converse, it's not always easy to do so calmly, steadily, listening well. Communication seems to me is one of the keys to, to helping with the anger issue. Do you agree? Yeah, I absolutely. But, but setting the ground rules for communication, like you just were suggesting, is incredibly important. Mm. Um, you know, going going back to again early in my marriage, I, I just I didn't understand. I love what you just said there. I didn't understand the game. I, mm. I, I had no clue what was happening. I, it was a model for me, right? Um, right. Very. Now my parents ended up becoming Christians, which I'm very thankful for. Mm. But when I was a, when I was a kid, my parents were anything but Christians, and mm. what was modeled for me was very very differently than what we see in the scripture about husbands and wives and the roles of husbands and wives. And so what I, what I like to do in the counseling room is, you know, kind of have people share what their expectations are. Um, so we can get it out on, out in the open, down yeah. on paper, um, you know, so to speak, and then compare and contrast those expectations to God's expectations for husbands and wives and, and followers and, and, and not shockingly, you'll be you won't be surprised to know how how staggeringly different these expectations can be um, from what God wants from us and for us and yeah. for what we want from others and for ourselves. Man, that's well said. Uh, this is why uh, for those listening and watching, I, I was very eager to have Dale come on and talk because I, I sense that because of your background, perhaps, Dale, uh, I don't want to get too deep in the psychological weeds here, but um, just in terms of life experience, you don't seem to have that um, sense that you have to gloss your conversation because perhaps of that background, when you talk to people, including me, about the rough and tumble of life, you are honest about it. It reminds me of Paul Tripp, for example. I would disagree with Paul Tripp on a few points in the last several years, but we're getting into a bit of a new Puritan purge here. And, and I think we want to watch out for that and, and not just get a humongous ban list. Um, anyway, Tripp is so good at being honest. He's, he's really good about being honest about sin and failing. And then he's really good about being honest about gospel grace. And I see that same work in you. And I so appreciate that because um, you're willing to square with the hardships of life and not, not gloss over them. But that's well, that's a common way to. I appreciate it. that. That's evidence of God's God's grace in my life and Him working in my life. Um, I don't think that would have been said of me maybe 15, 20 years ago. Mm. Uh, the gospel. Um, I've had two gospel. Um, I had my conversion right. Mm -hmm. So um, I was I was twenty seven years old when I got saved, and I, I knew what I got saved from. Yep. But I, because I didn't have a background in the church, um, I, I didn't come in glossy, like you said. I, I came in pretty real and pretty gritty. Um, that mm. was my upbringing. It was just very honest and um, kind of punchy in the face of honesty. Yeah. And about, I'd say maybe eight, nine years into my faith, gospel centrality was introduced to me by mm. John Benzinger, who's our lead pastor here at Redeemer. Amen. And that Good radically man. changed my life. 
radically changed my life. It changed who I was as a counselor, as a pastor. It changed who I was as a, as a husband. Um, and it prepared me for who I am as a father. And so I'm very, very thankful for, for the men who, who really brought gospel centrality to the forefront in the early 2000s, mid 2000s. And, and, and I was, I'm definitely a disciple of that thinking Yes, that, um, the gospel is not something that is a one-time thing we respond to. It's a day-by-day response to the good news of Jesus Christ. It sets us on a daily basis on the standing and understanding that we sh- that we should have about who we are and, um, and what he has done for us. Mm. And it reminds us that we're adopted children. Like mm. if you remind yourself you're an adopted child of, of the most high God uh, undeservingly, I don't know how you remain angry. Mm. I, I really don't. Um, you might have battles. You might go through daily, daily spouse of anger here and there, but oh, your overall arc is going to be a thank, thank, like Thanksgiving and thankfulness. And, and you become a much more gracious person mm. when you're constantly giving thanks to God. Um, yes. And so it, it is a process. I believe that progressive sanctification is real. It's yeah. not just something that happens like justification. There's a process of sanctification, but mm-hmm. the mm-hmm. gospel's at the very center of sanctification. And so if you're an angry person listening to this, I would submit that perhaps you're not um, focusing on the gospel as much as you should be yes. um, in your own life and living in the forgiveness and freedom that Christ has purchased for you. It's for freedom's sake that Christ has set you free. Don't ever mm. submit to a yoke of slavery. Galatians 5.1. Put down what's it, what enslaves you. Walk away from it. Because guess what? You might have chains on you, but there's no padlock. If, mm. if Jesus has set you free, mm. there is no padlock for those chains. Mm. You're just walking around in chains. Mm. It's kind of heavy, kind of cumbersome, not necessary. And, and again, I think a lot of that has to do with some of the anger issues that we're seeing today. People just aren't challenged with the truth. Hey, we'll be back to the conversation in just a minute, but I need to talk to you about something very important. At the very heart of our democracy lies a principle we hold sacred, free speech. It's the cornerstone that supports every freedom we cherish. Yet in today's digital age, discussions about our wealth, our rights, and our future are being silenced or overshadowed in mainstream narratives that leave many feeling voiceless in conversations crucial to our financial independence and security. This is where wealth protection research steps in, armed with a mission that has never been more critical. Wealth protection research is not a financial advisory firm. They're defenders of free speech. Yes, to free speech, committed to giving a voice to the silenced. Wealth protection research tirelessly seeks out financial experts. These are the voices that challenge prevailing narratives, especially as we navigate the uncertainties of the 2024 election. Wealth Protection Research has created a 2024 Election Wealth Protection Report. This free report highlights the three best ideas for protecting and growing your money heading into the 2024 election. It contains ideas the mainstream media won't touch, and listeners can get it completely free. Don't you love those words? Completely free. Text IDEAS, one word, IDEAS, to 76626 to claim your free copy. If you believe in the sanctity of free speech and the importance of financial freedom, then act now. Again, text IDEAS, just one word, to 76626 to claim your free copy of this 2024 election protection report. It's time to widen the scope of what we're told, to hear the ideas uh, the establishment does not think you can handle, and to take control of our financial destinies. How important is this? Text IDEAS to 76626 to claim your free copy. Now back to our conversation. I agree with that. And I think there's a fair dose of angry God theology out there where um, people have been trained to view God as as fundamentally angry at them. The love of God in some circles, there's a bunch of different contributing factors here. They're not all the same. They don't all hit the same groups of people. For sure. But the love of God has been said in, in some seminary settings and academic settings to be not real, basically. Uh, that's just anthropomorphic language. And so that can sound very high level. But here's the deal. When pastors are trained in settings where they are being taught by theologians that the love of God and, and the wrath of God as well are not real. That, that's not anything personal to God. That's just kind of a describing word that doesn't actually describe the true God. 
Um, what that can do is it can absolutely hollow out, for example, the love of God. And if you hollow out the love of God in your system, so God is not really loving, um, what is that? What effect is that going to have? Well, that's going to have an effect on you profoundly as a teacher and then the, the preachers you produce and then the people you shepherd. And you're going to have a movement, for example, in some settings in evangelical circles where there's a lot of talk about the holiness of God, for example. And you must talk about the holiness of God from many biblical texts. It must be a daily pursuit of your life as a Christian, full stop. But fundamentally, what is driving your pursuit of the holiness of God? Is it a gritted teeth pursuit and I can't sin and the law is just smashing me? Or is it the freedom you talked about in Christ, which is all driven by love, the love of God? Jeremiah 31, 3, I've loved you with an everlasting love. But Dale, I fear that there are, there are a fair number of young men and some young women too, who think that even talking much about the love of God is weak, is, you know, kind of a waste. That's what squishy churches talk about. That's not really for us over here in the Reformed crowd or the Bible crowd. And, and that concerns me. Well, all I would say to that, number one, I don't have an envelope for that kind of thinking. I, it's, it's hard for me to wrap my brain around it. Um, but I, I would just say this. Um, it was love that um, prompted Christ to take on flesh. And it was love that led him to the cross. And it was love um, that fueled the resurrection. And it's love that calls us to obedience. And it's, it's, not, it's not one or the other. It's right. both and. And, um, you know, I think a lot of times from my experience, I'll just put it this way, from my experience with people who are more truth people, fun, fundamentalist um, truth people, yeah, they're more focused on talking about others than, than they are talking about how the gospel has impacted them hmm. and leading from that angle. Um, there's a lot of shadows in the reform world and guys hiding in shadows of the reform world. Hmm. And, uh, yeah, I'll, I'll just I'll just say it that way. Yeah. And where the light is allowed to shine, God's grace and his truth both will be evident. Where there are shadows, I can speak from the shadows of my own life very authoritatively. And because I've got the word of God right here and I can just say, hey, man, this is what God's word says. And I don't have to talk about how it's impacted me. Um. I don't know. I, I think that's a dangerous position to be in personally. I think, especially if you're a pastor, your people need to know you struggle with sin. Uh, mm -hmm. If you're a pastor, they need to know that you're saved and they need to know what you got saved from. Mm -hmm. um, and there's a part of, I think the, the reformed world where we've lost that. And there, there are people talking about other people a little bit too much. Now, again, yeah. we do need to confront sin. We need to use right. God's word to confront sin, the sin of others. But it's it's both and. We, we have to be willing to talk about our own sanctification process as well. Because um, that's, I don't understand how you disciple somebody um, without doing that. Yeah, and I see a real emphasis switching gears slightly to um, taking back the world, making the nation right. Um, you're aware of these conversations. Yes, I've been involved sure. in them to some degree. Yeah. Um, and I, I think there's a lot of frustration from a kind of weak gospel appropriation in the last five to 10 years on the part of a good number of young men and also some young women. And so I think what has happened is um, a fair number of folks out there, younger folks, have heard the gospel talked about, but haven't seen the gospel applied and that has really, really frustrated them. They haven't seen courage take hold of a man talking about the gospel with regard to like this threat and this challenge and this real problem. And, and so there's been a deep disillusioning. And I sense that there's a fair number of the younger generation of the evangelical world that is equivalent to a child who looked up to their father all their days and now realizes that their father 
has failed in some very significant ways. And there hasn't necessarily been a whole lot of working through of that and humility and repentance on the part of the father figure. Uh, and, and so there's, there's a real sense of aggrievedness out there in the broader movement. And that has led to this push to make the Christian faith actionable and, and get stuff done. And yes, Paul says we've got to correct opponents with gentleness uh, in 2 Timothy 2, but that was for a different age. We're in desperate times. And what we need now are, to use your phrase earlier, men who are going to take the hill and, and, and we're not going to play nice and we're going to break things. And I'm just watching all this. And it, it saddens me in a very deep way. Well, at the risk of, of um, going viral, I, I will just say this. It's antichrist. Mm. That's antichrist in, in its thinking and in its, in its application. Um, there is a spiritual importance that I think is missed in the uh, conversation of Christian nationalism. Mm. That um, so I think that's what you're alluding to here. Yeah. Um, that you know we obviously don't have time to flesh out completely here, but I will say when you start with the the physical world and in the environment of government and um, wanting to see truth and justice and the good old American way. Um, not even restored. They, they don't want to restore anything. Actually, they want they want a new a, a new system put in place. Yes. But the problem is, is that you're talking about issues of the heart. We're not talking about issues of Washington D.C. Mm -hmm. Now you can look at Washington D.C. and see there's a lot of problems with the heart, right? But yeah, the way the way you win people is not from the top down. It's from the bottom up. And that's exactly what Jesus did. And the thinking of winning people from the top down, being authoritative um, and taking the hill, the hill and like, you know, just kind of like smash mouth Christianity, which is an oxymoron. Yes. Um, it, it's antichrist. I don't, I don't know of another way. I'm a simpleton. I don't know of another way to say it. Yeah. It, it's, it's not what Jesus would do um, to steal that phrase. Uh, it's the opposite of what Christ did and would do. Yeah. Hey, got to jump out of our conversation for just a minute to talk about something very, very important. Endless doom scrolling on your TV platform to try to find entertaining content. You've been there. I've been there. 30 minutes passes, an hour passes, perhaps even two hours pass, and then you just fall asleep and you end up watching nothing. I have a better way forward for you. Hillsdale College is offering more than 40 free online courses in the most important and enduring subjects. You can learn about the works of C.S. Lewis, the stories in the book of Genesis, the meaning of the U.S. Constitution, the rise and fall of the Roman Republic, because we're all thinking about the Roman Empire on a daily basis, or the history of the ancient Christian church with Hillsdale College's online courses, all available for free. That's right for free. I personally recommend you sign up for a great course, Winston Churchill and Statesmanship. In this six lecture course, Hillsdale College President Dr. Larry Arn, one of the world's foremost scholars of Churchill, explores how Winston Churchill defended constitutional government against the unique dangers of totalitarian government and modern warfare. The course is self-paced so that you could start whenever and wherever you fall asleep some night after a long day at work. You can start it up the next day. Start your free course, Winston Churchill and Statesmanship with Dr. Larry Arn today. Fantastic opportunity before you. Go right now to hillsdale.edu slash grace to start. It's free. It's easy to get started. That's hillsdale.edu slash grace. One word to start hillsdale.edu slash grace. Let's jump back into the conversation. Yeah, I, I see that same spirit. Um, there's talk in the conservative world. I, I think I can use that term, although increasingly I'm wondering who is truly conservative and who is anarcho-fascist, to use a slightly different term. Um, but, you know, there's there's this push, for example, not to get us into the weeds, but to, to see a Protestant Franco arise, for example, and all of that is done under the banner of Christ. And I am all for good political leaders. I am all for being salt and light in a Matthew 5 sense. I know you are too. I want Christians to run for office and be very engaged in the public square Absolutely. and make good laws and stand against evil and all of that. And, and I know you do too. But fundamentally, um, 
the banner of Christ is marching through the church. The, the church is holding the banner, if you will. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and, and God is doing the work and God is, is, is building his people. And, um, that is not something that can be taken by force. That is not something that a government can enact. And, and the manner among young men, aggrieved, angry young men, uh, at least some, uh, today is, is thus not a manner that comports with what the Bible talks about. And so I'm going to read a, a brief passage that I just alluded to, but let me just say this. If somebody is saying to you that the Apostle Paul's mandate for behavior, for conduct among unbelievers or, or believers, no longer applies, you should engage that person in love and you should run from their teaching. You should not ally with them. You should not make them your go-to teacher uh, they are not leading you in a sound direction because the Apostle Paul knew a thing or two, just a thing or two about persecution and, um, you know, suffering for the cause of Christ. And here is what he said in the midst of all that from prison. And the Lord's servant, 2 Timothy 2.24, must not be quarrelsome, but kind to everyone, able to teach, patiently enduring evil, correcting his opponents with gentleness. God may perhaps grant them repentance, leading to a knowledge of truth, of the truth, and they may come to their senses and escape from the snare of the devil after being captured by him to do his will. So this passage, just very quickly, I'll say a word and then throw it back to you, Dale. This passage, 2 Timothy 2, 24 to 26, is so instructive for us, and it calls us to do exactly the opposite of what is so easy to do for all of us, me included, on social media, quarrel. Um, it's like kind of like somebody created social media just to quarrel. Um, if that wasn't the intent, you got a serious byproduct there. Uh, but we're not supposed to be quarrelsome, especially men in ministry, by the way. How are we supposed to conduct ourselves? This is an apostle who's going to be killed for the gospel under persecution. We're supposed to be kind to everyone, patiently endure evil, and correct opponents with gentleness. Dale, I'll, I'll cut off my little sermon here and throw it back to you. We're almost done with this episode. How does that strike you in light of where we are in 2024 as I read that? Yeah, I mean, it, I'm not encouraged, I'll put it that way, um, by what I'm seeing in our, in our culture, in the church. Um, some of the voices out there who... Um, and again, I think they're angry voices, which is what we've been talking about. Um, but I have hope, mm -hmm. right? So I will say this. I, I think I think also part of this conversation um, is is the word loyalty, and what do we feel loyal to, or towards, or who? You know, what are we loyal to? And I think I think there's a lot of well-meaning people who. Mm -hmm. Are, are concerned about what's going on in our culture, concerned about what's going on in our country. Yeah. And they feel a sense of loyalty to our country, which I also feel. Um, yeah. I want to protect uh, the, the legacy of the United States as best as, as best as I can, yeah. but not at the expense of my loyalty to Christ. Hmm. And I think sometimes that's what gets missed in this whole conversation is we're, we're not here, at least in my eschatology, we're not here to, to usher in a, a utopia, right? Um, we should expect sin. We should expect problems. <clears throat> we should expect um, evil people to do evil things. Um, mm -hmm. But we should also expect the church to be the church. Mm -hmm. And for the church to be the church, there has to be a loyalty to Jesus. There's not a, sus a suspension of uh, what Paul's talking about there in First Corinthians. You don't suspend that. That is God's word. That is true yesterday, today, and tomorrow, and will be true for all eternity. Amen. Um, so people who want to suspend and, and say this is not a time for that, uh, I'm going to question their loyalty. I'm going to question their loyalty to the mm -hmm. faithfulness of the scripture and the faithfulness of the author who wrote the scripture. Yeah. And again... <clears throat> I know I'm going to get nailed for that. <clears throat> Excuse my voice. I know I'm going to get nailed for that on social media, but I'm okay with that because I, I know it's true. Yeah. And so if I'm going to get nailed for truth, 
that's fine with me. Um, my loyalty lies with Christ, not with the United States of America. Mm-hmm. But I want to be a blessing to this country. Right. I want my relationship with Jesus to be a blessing to this country. And so that's why I do believe that politics, Christians should be in the political realm. Christians should vote. Christians should be writing laws and, and, and leading the way, frankly, um, when it comes to politics. But not, not at the expense of, of my faith, not at the expense of what the word has called me to do and, and, and how the word has called me to love. Um, I'm not going to suspend that. Amen. As we conclude here, let me just chime in and say amen to that. Um, That is exactly right. Um, Fundamentally, there is a real specter arising in our time. I I agree with you. Very strong words, but apt apt words. The spirit of Antichrist, a different Christ, a Christ who seems to be some sort of political conqueror. Make no mistake, (laughs) Jesus is going to come back and make the earth his footstool. Uh, Mm -hmm. So so let's not think that Jesus is coming back to to have playtime and use Play-Doh. Uh, with with uh, with the little ones in the corner, you know, for fun. No, no, no. When Jesus comes back, he's coming back as in in, in full uh, garb as the 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 conquering king. Um, but right now, we are not conquering people nationally and thinking that we are making the world right. That is what Christ does. We instead conquer as the church, so to speak, through proclamation, through love through forgiveness, through mercy, through truth. And so I pray with Dale as we conclude this episode that those who are upset, angry, embittered uh, for reasons understandable and then for unreasonable expectations, I pray that there will be great healing. I pray that we will remember that when Jesus, for example, shows up to his disciples after his resurrection in John 20, the greeting he gives them is not, what are you doing? Get out of this room. Go go Christianize the world, you idiots. It is instead, peace be with you. Mm. Peace be upon you. And I would say that to the church today, men and women alike. There is peace upon us, not by our own efforts, but through the blood of Christ's cross. My guest today has been Dale Thacker, thank you so much for joining me uh, today, Dale. Thank you, Owen. I appreciate it very much. Really good conversation with him. And uh, as Dale did several times, humbly, <laughs> the, the matters we've talked about, the issues we've, we've a- addressed here are issues we ourselves have to battle. Those are sin patterns that we ourselves have had to overcome and are going to have to fight in different forms until the day we die. So none of us is uh, speaking from a lofty mountain peak. None of us has this all figured out. But praise God, God is working in our lives to bring shalom. There's grace and truth in Jesus Christ and Christ alone. God bless you.